So I just want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Kelsey O'Donnell and I am the communications manager for the Brain Center of Green Bay. Um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the Brain Center of Green Bay, we are a local nonprofit, uh, a high impact uh, organization that works with several of our wonderful local resources to help to make brains better. Um, we do this by collaborating with wonderful local nonprofits, including the ADRC, who is here today to present with Sherry. Um, and so that's just started over to you, Sherry. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. As Kelsey said, my name is Sherry. I am the dementia care specialist with the Aging and Disability Resource Center in Brown County. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ADRC um, as a shameless plug for the agency. And I'll talk about my role as a dementia care specialist um, I'll talk a little bit about dementia, and we'll talk about some of the things that we can do as care partners for people with dementia to help them have the best experience they can with the disease and have um, the care partner also have a good experience. It is um, quite challenging, and so it's not easy, and a lot of the things that I will talk about don't come as common sense. Um, so this is something that... Um, hopefully will be informative and helpful. So as I work for the Aging and Disability Resource Center, we provide services to people who are elderly or disabled, um, people 17 and a half and older, um, and people with um, intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, um, people who um, are dealing with issues related to aging, and as you can imagine, a lot of the people we talk to are caregivers or care partners and people who are providing help and support to people who are um, having some other forms of disabilities, including dementia. We also work with professionals. Um, so you can imagine the uh, hospital, uh, social workers, or home care agencies, other facilities, um, and other community partners will often refer people to us to, for our services. Um, I am the dementia care specialist. I am one of 33 in the state at this time. Um, this map indicates where the dementia care specialists are, um, and the green spots are tribal dementia care specialists. So I am the only one in Brown County, in addition to the dementia care specialist in Oneida, who covers a little piece of Brown and a little piece of Outagamie County. And we were born out of um, the state taking a look at our demographics and realizing that the number of people um, who are aging is increasing um, quite rapidly with the baby boomers. And the number one risk factor of developing dementia being age, realize we need to do some things in our community to help people with dementia and their care par partners and caregivers um, be able to handle this disease for as long as possible and how what we can do for the community to do better at, at supporting the people with dementia and their care partners. So we're charged with doing three things basically um, amongst many others, but they kind of fall under these three, uh, making sure that the ADRC is dementia capable. So I do internal trainings for staff and volunteers. We also work with dementia friendly communities. So we have a dementia friendly community coalition here in Brown County. Um, where um, we are a, a group of professionals, caregivers, even people with dementia who are working together to help our community become dementia friendly, knowledgeable. Um, and then the other part is supporting people with dementia and their caregivers. So I actually spend a lot of time working with people who are caregiving for somebody with dementia. I also spend time with people with dementia, answering questions, helping to explain the brain disease, what might be going on in the brain that's causing some of the symptoms that we see, and what can we do to help um, make it everything just a better experience as much as possible. Um, and I'll talk about some of those ways today. Um, by the way, we are a small group, I see. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to um, unmute or put it in the chat or however, Kelsey, they people can um, communicate. Um, I, if you're like me, if I have to save my question for the end, I'm most likely going to forget it. So feel free to blurt it out. 
Wonderful. Yeah, go ahead and put it in the chat. I will monitor that too. And if I see any in there, I'll just uh, quickly interject and let you know, Sherry. Thanks. Um, so one of the number one questions I get from people is, what is dementia? And um, how do I know it's dementia or Alzheimer's disease? And so um, I do a lot of explaining what dementia is. Dementia is a group of symptoms. It's not necessarily a diagnosis in itself, kind of like a cough and a runny nose might be, um, or sore throat, those might be the a common cold, or you might have bronchitis might be the diagnosis, but those are those other parts are your symptoms. So dementia is a group of symptoms that affect thinking, memory, reasoning, planning, all these things that we need to use our brain for, not just memory. As you can see, being able to understand cause and effect um, and challenges with that could be a dementia symptom. And for them to be dementia symptoms, they need to really be enough that affect your everyday life, not just the occasional stepping out of the grocery store and thinking, oh my gosh, where did I park my car? Um, that's not enough for it to be dementia. Of course, we probably all could say, all right, that's happened to me. Um, it has to be enough where it really starts to impact your daily life. And it's important to note that confusion in an older person isn't always due to an irreversible dementia. Dementia in the brain, another way of thinking about it is brain failure. It's the person's brain is actually dying. The brain cells are dying. And one of the things that makes this disease so challenging to caregive for is because we can't see the changes. You know, when somebody has diabetes and they need to have their leg amputated, we can see that they don't have their leg anymore. And so we can help them. We can see that they're going to struggle getting out of the car so we can actively help them. With dementia, that brain disease and the brain cell death, we don't see it. And that can make it harder to, um, in when we're caregiving. There are a um, hundred or more different types of dementia, of irreversible dementias. So dementia is the umbrella term. So somebody might be having dementia symptoms due to Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the diagnosis. Somebody might be having dementia symptoms due to frontal temporal dementia. That's where the disease is affecting the front and the temporal sides of the brain. Somebody might be having dementia symptoms due to Lewy body dementia. Lewy body is an abnormal protein that attaches to the brain cell that causes brain cell death. Somebody might be having dementia symptoms due to vascular dementias. So somebody who might be having, um, who have had a stroke or uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled high blood pressure or even um, untreated sleep apnea. Vascular dementia is related to blood flow to the brain. Every time your heart beats, about 25% of the blood goes to your brain. So if you've got something cardiovascular going on in your body, affecting oxygen flow to the brain, and you start noticing symptoms, you could be experiencing a vascular dementia. Then on this list to the side is a whole bunch of other types of dementias. Those four I mentioned are the most common, with Alzheimer's disease being the most common. People often have mixed dementias. So they may have Alzheimer's disease with vascular. Um, I know a lot of people um, when, they, when they have autopsies done and it's found that they had Alzheimer's disease, they often will find Lewy body, those abnormal proteins in the brain as well. So you know how I mentioned the leg and you can't really, um, you can see that somebody's missing a leg and you can see what they might need help with. Um, this is an image of the brain. Now we can't see this, but if we could, it might help us to understand why a person with dementia may struggle getting through their regular day. On the left is a normal brain. So this is a brain that does not have disease. You can see it's big and juicy and it's got lots of wrinkles in it, but it's compact and really tight in there. And it's very healthy. The brain on the right, has Alzheimer's disease. 
So those brain cells have been dying, causing atrophy, and the actual brain is shrinking. So we can see the wrinkles, but there's so many gaps between them because that is where the brain cells were. So when somebody has brain cell death, it's absolutely going to impact every part of their day, every part of their life, everything we do as human beings goes through our brain. And so when the brain has a disease, we can imagine how that is impacting everything that we do. So this is a nice little chart to get us really thinking about the different things that dementia, irreversible dementias can do inside the brain. So amnesia, this is one of the most common ones, memory loss not being able to remember short-term memories at first, most often. And then as the disease progresses, losing some of those long-term memories. Agnosia, so they can no longer recognize things using their senses. They're having a hard time recognizing faces or familiar objects. Um, difficulty understanding what they're seeing and hearing. Aphasia. This is a loss of ability to speak, understand, read, write. So um, people may have expressive aphasia. They may actually have a very flat affect and seemingly not very concerned or seem to care about the fact that you're having a very bad day. They can seem just very flat. And oftentimes when people are experiencing aphasia, they can actually um, isolate themselves. And, and, and keep themselves from being out in, in the world because they, they're not able to engage. Apraxia, the loss of ability to tell your body how to carry out purposeful movements. This is very true with Lewy body um, and Parkinson's dementias. And as Alzheimer's or vascular dementia progresses, it progresses to the point where your brain has a hard time telling your body what to do perception. We can misinterpret the information our senses give us. This is where we hear people are having hallucinations. It isn't hallucinations due to a mental health condition like schizophrenia. It's hallucinations due to brain cell death. And so that plant we see over in the corner, in our brain, we're perceiving it as a small child. And now we want to make sure somebody takes care of that small child over there. But that's not what's over there. It's a plant. It's just how their brain has perceived what they see. Anosognosia, so the inability to understand that something has changed. This is very common. People with dementia sometimes will know and understand that something's going on. They'll recognize some changes in themselves. But people, um, a lot of people with dementia do not. They are. Well, we'll care, care partners will often say that they're in denial. Well, they're not in denial. It's that their brain cells aren't communicating with each other anymore. So they can't understand their own deficits. They don't see their own decline. And the last one on here is apathy, which is another way of saying loss of initiative. So one of the things I talk about when I talk about apathy is not so much that the person is no longer interested in doing anything anymore. It's more that they've lost the ability to initiate the task or to understand the steps involved to do the task. And so people with dementia, you offer them a yes or no question, you're most likely going to get a no. We are hardwired for the negative. So when we say, would you like to garden? Would you like to do your crossword puzzle? Would you like to play a game of cards? Would you like to go to church? Would you like to go to the grocery store? All of these things, oftentimes we'll get a no. Mm, no, no. It's that they don't always know the steps involved to complete those tasks. As care partners, we can take on the first few steps of these tasks for them and help them get connected and start to enjoy some of the activities they used to enjoy by doing some of those steps. So for example, we might um, get a, a coloring book out rather than say, would you like to color? 
we might get the coloring book out and set it in front of us and set the crayons out and and kind of start coloring and then say what color do you think oh well here here's one for you and then this person can start actually doing that task of coloring without ever being asked would you like to color or to or any responsibility to figure out those steps involved to complete that task. Apathy is one of those symptoms we can see quite early on. So now that we thought about all those thing, ways that dementia can impact the brain, if we just take a minute and imagine what that might feel like to be experiencing all of those symptoms, we might feel fearful or anxious, disoriented, confused. When we put ourselves in their shoes, we can start to see the world they live in and their reality. And it builds that sense of empathy. So these are some of the most common expressions. Um, we can call them behaviors, which is something that we may be most comfortable hearing, but I like to call them expressions because it encourages us to look beyond the words. So wandering, when people say, oh, my loved one has started wandering. Well, people who wander are typically communicating something. They're usually looking for something, going somewhere, have an unmet need. So when we get really good at recognizing behaviors or expressions like wandering, we get really good at looking behind the scenes and trying to figure out what is it this person is trying to tell me through this behavior. Rummaging, hoarding, these are very common behaviors that people with dementia have. And so when we say my loved one has really started a hoarding things, we start thinking, what are they communicating to me? by hiding things or keeping things that maybe would normally go in the garbage. So we can start to shift the way we think from challenging behaviors and start thinking into personal expressions, communications, um, verbal outbursts, yelling, excessive vocalizations, cursing. Um, these are things, t different things that we'll do in our brain. For whatever reason with dementia, the parts of the brain that allow us to remember those swear words aren't quite as affected as the part of our brain that tries to remember what, you know, a pen is. I can't seem to think of this, but boy, does a swear word come out of my mouth quite easily. Um, physical hitting, spitting, kicking, people are communicating something. This is something you'll hear me say. When somebody gets diagnosed with dementia, they're no longer accountable for their behavior. They're no longer accountable for their behavior. They're not to be held responsible. We have to help them by understanding. Remember, their brain cells are dying. So when they're doing something like being physical or hitting or spitting, we need to step back and take a look at their environment. These are some of the things we'll talk about today. And hopefully you'll have some questions that um, maybe I can help you problem solve. Paranoia, very common. You know, like I said, we are hardwired for the negative. And with dementia, everything is attached to emotions how I feel is going to impact how I behave. And so when I don't feel good because of all those symptoms we talked about and I'm living in a state of anxiety, but I don't know that, I have to figure out why I don't feel good. Well, it must be because my husband um, is hiding something or my daughter is talking about me behind my back or the millions of different things that we see when people become paranoid. It isn't that they really believe those things or that those things are true. It's that's the best their brain can do to make sense of the emotions they're feeling. Hallucinations, we talked about that. Um, and so all different types of dementia can impact different types of hallucinations. And oftentimes they're harmless 
oh, the kids were over here and they were playing and we had a wonderful time. Um, and we know that didn't happen um, and it doesn't cause a bad emotion. So that's common. Sometimes they could be scary hallucinations and those are ones that we wanna see what we can do about. Shadows on the floor can be perceived as holes. And so I can't get to the bathroom because there's a hole on the floor. Um, so those are like those perceptions that we were talking about before. Sleep and wake cycle disorders, um, very common. People may find that they sleep for three days and then they're up for three days, um, waking up in the middle of the night thinking it's morning. All of these are very co common expressions that we see. Uh, inappropriate sexual expression. So um, this is one that we hear of sometimes where people are um, demonstrating some sexual behavior that we say is inappropriate. So remember, this is a personal expression that people are trying to communicate something to us. What, what is it? Oftentimes it could be something physical. They could be um, constipated. They could have tight clothing. They could be experiencing a rash. Um, and if it is a sexual type behavior, um, that's, that's true sexual intentions, what can we do to help them? Um, and, and so these types of things are, again, as we're looking at these, we're thinking, what is this person communicating to me? What are they communicating? Um, repetitive questions, that's like in the beginning, right? When people first start um, experiencing dementia symptoms, they tend to repeat themselves and, um, or tell the story again and then tell it again. And um, that's due to the short-term memory loss. Um, but people, when they're very anxious, you'll find that those types of repetitiveness can increase. Resistance to personal care. So I don't need a shower, I just showered. Well, we know that person didn't shower for a couple weeks, but they believe they just showered and I don't need any help. I'm completely independent. Um, and so what are they communicating to us? And sundowning. So sundowning is a big term. And I hope you can see all of these are big terms that we use when really we need to peel that word off. Let's take the word sundowning off and let's talk about the actual behavior. So rather than say this person is sundowning, we say, it seems like every day at three o'clock, they start to get anxious and pace. And then they start going in the drawers and then they start getting upset and they might start yelling at the TV. We have to talk about what those symptoms actually are rather than give it one lump word. You know, you've probably heard it before, but I'll say it again. When you know one person with dementia, you know, one person with dementia, they're all different. So somebody's sundowning experience may look nothing like somebody else's. Somebody else's sundowning experience might start at seven in the morning today and tomorrow it's at two and the next day it's at three in the morning. And so we want to get really good at um, understanding these labels are there to help us kind of funnel things down, but we've got to take that label off and really look at that person's experience. So in case you were, haven't caught on yet, um, all behavior is communication, right? And we use, like to use personal expressions rather than challenging behaviors. Although I get it, sometimes these behaviors are challenging. But as we start to see that person and what they're experiencing, we can start to see what they're trying to communicate to us. So this is six pieces of the puzzle. When we're trying to figure out what might be going on, this is kind of our roadmap. These are the things that could impact the behavior for people with dementia. And I'm going to go through each of them in a little more detailed. Um, but these are the things that can affect time. Where are they in time? Are they perceiving time? Um, is something going on with the stakeholder? Okay, the stakeholder is us, the care partners, the caregivers. What about the environment? What's going on in the environment that might be something that can contribute to this person's experience? Those are those um, extrinsic factors, those types of things that are easier to change. Okay, we can have a little more impact on those. The next set are a little harder. 
So brain changes. So things that are happening in the brain are going to impact that person. We may not be able to do a lot about that, um, but uh, we can do some things to help support them. Um, the person themselves and health changes. So let's go in a little more detail about each of these. All right. Talking about time, when people um, with dementia, as we know, they're not necessarily oriented to time. You and I, we understand where we are um, in our time. I know what I did earlier today. I know what I have coming up. And there's a sense of security and comfort in that. So with people with dementia, they don't necessarily know how long I've been sitting here watching TV. Am I supposed to be somewhere? Some, am I supposed to meet somebody? I'm an adult. I've got some responsibilities. You know, where, maybe I'm supposed to go meet somebody. Um, this is where we say that wandering may not necessarily be that they're just wandering. Wandering is actually an unfair term. They have some place they're going and something they're doing. We just need to be curious enough to find that out. So somebody not being sure about where they are in time can be very disorienting and increase anxiety. Um, what are they doing with their time? Are they productive? People need to have a sense of purpose. That sense of purpose is huge. And so when we're sitting and we don't have anything that's going on or any need, anybody needs us, that can be very upsetting, disorienting, and not using up a lot of the energy that we have stored up. What are they doing for fun? Are they, are they enjoying themselves? Uh, sometimes people with dementia aren't always being engaged with because they can't always contribute to the conversation. So are they feeling um, challenged cognitively and considered? Um, how about their wellness, their self-care? Um, what about relaxation time? Sometimes things can be a little overstimulating. Next is the stakeholders. That's us. How are we doing? Do we know about dementia? Do we understand the person's reality? Um, do we need some more education? Do we need a break? You know, when, when dementia gets this big, we need to spend this much time with the person so that we can love them this much. This is so true. We've got to make sure that we take care of ourselves. Like what's going on in our relationship with this person? It definitely has changed and that can be stressful and impactful. What's our agenda? Okay, we have a doctor's appointment coming up at nine in the morning and we need to eat breakfast and we've got to take a shower and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And so we've got our own agenda. People with dementia are very in tuned to how we behave and our tone of voice. And nothing will slow people with dementia down faster than somebody pushing their agenda. So being aware of that. The environment. The environment has a huge impact on people with dementia. Um, is it oh, the four Fs, friendly, familiar, functional, forgiving? Take a look around. Um, if, is the TV on? Is it too loud? Are there things that you can trip over? Is it cluttered? Do we have things that are triggers sitting out? Like we don't want our loved one to drive anymore, yet we have the keys sitting on the keychain or on the key hook. Um, we don't want them necessarily drinking alcohol anymore, but you know the liquor cabinet is right there. Um, are there people um, visiting? Are there too many people? Are there not enough people? Um, are the curtains open? Are the curtains closed? What's the temperature? Is it warm, cold? All of these things can impact that person with dementia. And so they might actually be telling you something about the environment. For example, I worked with um, a woman who was caregiving for her father and he wanted his guns. So they had the gun cabinet right there. And he needed his guns and he wanted them now, not his rifles. He wanted his pistols. I want my pistols, get them out of the gun case. Well, they weren't going to open the gun case for him. And he became very angry and upset and did some of those behaviors like hitting, kicking, yelling, screaming 
but what he's communicating is something we had to figure out. So we've tried lots of things to disguise the gun cabinet so he couldn't see it anymore. Yeah, it helped a little bit. She on her own figured this out. What she learned was that he always wanted his guns at three o'clock in the day. Well, that happened to be the time he was watching gun smoke. He didn't want his rifles. He wanted his pistols and he wanted them now. So his communication was this show is making me want my guns and I need them. She changed the show to a fishing channel and he stopped asking for his guns. So as an example of how we can help people have a better emotion by paying attention to the environment. Other pieces of the puzzle, brain changes. What's going on in the brain? Do we know what type of dementia this is? You know, you may be surprised, but a lot of doctors don't give a type. They might say this is dementia, but they won't give a type of diagnosis. The type is very important. It's important because how we approach them will change if it's Lewy body versus Alzheimer's disease. It's important because there are medications that are more unsafe to give some people, like people with Lewy body um, versus somebody with Alzheimer's. Um, or medications in general that we should avoid giving people with dementia. So do we know what type of dementia this is? You know, people with Lewy body may not actually experience a whole lot of memory issues, but they'll have a hard time navigating their environment or reasoning. So um, understanding that is, is going to be important. Is there something going on that may be isn't related to the dementia? Could they be experiencing a delirium, um, depression, anxiety? Do they have a urinary tract infection? Which we could move over to health changes on that one, but paying attention to that. Um, are they unable to do something they used to be able to do and now they're be experiencing frustration with that? The person. What is their life history? What did they used to do? That's one of the questions I ask often is what did they used to do? Um, working with somebody who used to be an accountant and he goes through books and he's got his pen and he's, you know, tapping on this and going through his books and he'll spend hours a day doing this. Well, he's looking for his sense of purpose, right? But he used to do this. What did he used to do? Let's try and help him to do that again. Maybe not in the way he did it before, but in his reality, help him. Um, what were their personality traits? Was somebody tend to be more patient than others or somebody who um, maybe had a short temper? Um, what are their preferences? What do they like and dislike? You know, sometimes people will start to like things they didn't like before, but a lot of times if they didn't like oranges, then giving them orange flavored things might make them upset. We need to pay attention to that. Um, what kinds of things happened in their lives that brought them joy? Um, what about trauma? Trauma can impact us. It does impact us. It impacts the brain. It changes the brain. So if somebody experienced a trauma distant in their distant past, that trauma might be coming up now as something that's happened more recently in their perception. And we need to understand that as best as we can to help them through that. What are their values? Um, do, they, do they go to church? Is praying important to them? Um, have they not been going to church since the diseases um, affected them? Um, those types of things. Uh, what was their role in their life? Were they the type of person who liked to watch? Were they the person who liked to talk about things? Or were they the hands-on type of person to do things? The more we know, the better we can care. And then health changes. I had mentioned a UTI or urinary tract infection. For people who are older, even without dementia, can uh, urinary tract infection or infection in general can impact their cognition. Um, and that's short term. Now, if somebody has a dementia and they have a urinary tract infection, we're going to see a sudden change. Just to note, any kind of sudden change, because dementia is a slow progress, progressing disease, any kind of sudden change 
often means we need to see the doctor because somebody could have a stroke or a urinary tract infection or something that could be going on that needs medical attention. So other health changes, you know, are they dehydrated? You know, dehydration can cause confusion. And even when people with dementia, just getting them hydrated again can help them ha have a clearer head. Medications, are they taking their medications right? Are there side effects happening? Um, what about their emotional or psychological condition? You know, has something happened in their life that they're holding on to? You know, memories are stored in a different place in the brain than emotions. And so when we have something happen, we may not remember it, but the emotion we feel will linger. The more intense that emotion is, the more likely it is to connect to the memory. This is why when we tell people you can't drive anymore, well, they can't remember what they had for breakfast, but for some reason they won't forget that you said that because there's a lot of emotional attachment to it. So remember when I said people with dementia, it's all about emotions. It's all about emotions. We really want to pay attention to what their emotion is and try to help them have a better one using these pieces of the puzzle. Um, any, other, any other health changes, those things can definitely affect a person with dementia. So a lot of times as care partners, we want to take very good care of our loved one with dementia. And so we notice these symptoms like anxiety, depression, hallucinations, all the other expressions that we talked about, the wandering, the um, hitting or, or, or inappropriate sexual expressions. And so we talk to our doctor and we let the doctor know some of these symptoms that we're seeing. And doctors, you know, they don't need to know a lot of stuff and they're very smart. And this, the challenging thing is they get to see this patient in a room, not in their environment with everything else that's going on. And doctors pull from their toolbox and their toolbox is referrals or medication, right? And so sometimes when, we, when we're as care partners saying they're so anxious, they're pacing, they won't sleep at night, doctors wanna help you, you wanna help your loved one. And so they'll prescribe something that might hopefully be helpful. But here's where I'm saying, look at those six pieces of the puzzle. And um, except for maybe an antibiotic for a UTI, usually a medication isn't going to help a lot of those things. So in this diagram, you see a person on the top left that has a brain disease, and then the arrow points down to the behavior. And there's three things. Now we've, we've identified six, but I've condensed them into these three things that can cause these behaviors in people with dementia. And that's the person with dementia. Do they have an infection? Are they hot? Are they cold? Are they bored? Are they understimulated, overstimulated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The caregiver, are they exhausted? Are they burnt out? Do they need some more information about dementia and caregiving. What about the environment? What's going on in the environment? Is the TV on? Is the evening news on? Because that can be very upsetting for people. Is there a lot of shadows? Is it too light, too dark, hot, or cold? So when we think about all the potential things related to the person with dementia, the caregiver in the environment, these medications that are often prescribed don't necessarily treat what this person is communicating to us. So if the person with the wanting the guns, the, the, the treatment, the intervention was changing the channel. Although you could see how a caregiver might want to give them a medication to help treat that because that's very dangerous if you were to get a hold of the guns. And this person is very upset. So we want to help them feel upset. This is my little squiggly question marks is like, a medication isn't necessarily going an antipsychotic or an, uh, an anti-anxiety medication isn't exactly going to take away the urinary tract infection, isn't going to hydrate the person, isn't going to um, help that caregiver get a break. And so it's not that medications are never to be used. You know, if somebody is at risk of harming themselves or others, and we need to use a medication as a last resort, Absolutely. But I'm here to say there's so many other things we can try before. 
the anti-anxiety medications or antipsychotic medications can be very dangerous for people with dementia and oftentimes they're black boxed. Something else to note as we're talking about caregiving is that people with dementia are very adept at reading body language and tone of voice. So it can be tricky as a care partner in your caregiving when you um, want to be very genuine, yet you are exhausted. And I'll tell you, they can read it in your voice. Um, and people, <laughs> people are always amazed by it, you know, uh, rolling the eyes or whatever. Um, and because people with dementia can often experience paranoia, they're going to read it and they're going to assume something not so good. So keeping that in mind. This is my fish analogy I made up. So people with dementia are like fish in the water. They live in the water. That's their reality. We are up here on land and this is our reality. So while somebody with dementia might feel like they're perfectly safe driving, we know they're not, right? We're up here on land. But if we pull a fish out of water to show them our reality, they don't like it. Fish, they don't like being out of the water. They flip, they flop. They want to be in the water. Because we don't have a cognitive impairment, we need to get in the water with them. And once we're in the water with them and we look around and we say, okay, this person does not see that they are unsafe driving. So now I need to help keep them from driving without pulling them out of water. When we explain to people with dementia, when we reason, when we argue, when we convince, it's like pulling a fish out of water. So like saying like, hey, you can't drive because you have dementia and you're not safe. What? That's not true. I'm perfectly fine. All of that reasoning, arguing, convincing, um, and explaining are all ways that we can cause anxiety in people with dementia. We want them to feel least anxious as possible. So we're going to get in the water with them. And what we're going to do is accommodate rather than control. So in this example with the driving is we might make it so that um, we're just gonna drive this time. You drove last time, it's my turn. We might hide the keys so they're not a visual trigger. Sometimes we get rid of their car so it's not a visual trigger. Sometimes we disable the car. Um, sometimes we have the doctor write a note so that the DMV sends a letter. I mean, there is no one right way of doing it. But the best way to do it is to understand how their emotions are and try to help them to get through being safe in the best emotion possible. So when we're caregiving for people with dementia, we understand that the, the dementia doesn't just impact the brain. It impacts our vision, our hearing, our all of our senses. So when we understand that people with dementia struggle with seeing things in the same way that they used to, we understand where we need to be when we're caregiving for them. So if we sit back and anybody at the age, at the age of 25, you put your hands directly straight out in front and you wiggle your fingers, you can see them. At 75 years old, this is people without dementia, we move our hands into 45 degrees, wiggle our fingers, that's our peripheral vision. People with dementia are more like binoculars. So if you put the binoculars up by your face, you have a hard time seeing things. So we put the plate of food in front of them, but I look down, I can't see my food. Or I could look at my shirt, my shirt's dirty. I can't see my shirt, no it's not. So we start to understand that the person with dementia is having a very different experience. As the disease progresses, it turns into monocular vision. When we do monocular vision, we lose depth perception. So if I drop something on the floor, I go to pick it up. I can't actually see how far it is down. This is where falls come in. So people with dementia have an increase in falls. So when we start to understand the different changes in them, I'm gonna move that out of there. Never mind. 
Okay. As we understand that they're experiencing changes, not just in their brain, but in how they perceive everything, we can become better at supporting them. So when we come up to a person with dementia, we want to greet them from an arm's length distance. And we put our hand up by our face because remember they have the monocular vision. We want them to see our face. So we say, hi, and we introduce ourselves. You know, hi, hey, Dr. Luloff, it's Sherry. And I reach my hand out and we can shake hands. And then we can do hand under hand so that my hand is under the person with dementia's hand. This is called supportive stance, hand under hand. When we're doing this, we're helping respect that person with dementia and we're understanding what their reality is and their experiences. Making sure that we don't approach somebody until they see us. We first hear, then we see. So when somebody knocks, we hear and we turn and look. So we want to make sure that we are considering all of that while we're working with people with dementia. So um, like I said, whenever we're working with people with dementia, we greet them first, right? We, even knocking, even if, even if we're in an open room and they're sitting, we can kind of knock at, a ta at the table and they're going to look up. Hi, it's Sherry. And we offer our hand. So we don't touch them until they see us. Sometimes people will come up behind somebody with dementia and kind of put their hand on their shoulder. That's a great way to kind of increase anxiety right away. Remember, my peripheral vision is like this, and I don't know who you are. Make sure we're not doing to somebody with dementia, but rather doing with. This hand under hand that I showed you is a great way to take, get through some tasks like feeding or even toileting and dressing. When we're helping people move their body, muscle memory kicks in. So when somebody is trying to brush their teeth, rather than go at them with a toothbrush, that, that's never good <laughs> for any of us, we can put the toothbrush in our hand with their hand. And now we're brushing their teeth and they're moving their arm. And then muscle memory can kick in. Oftentimes people will be like, what are you doing? And they'll just take over when they wouldn't even know what a toothbrush was before. It's about supporting people, maintaining what they still can do. And sometimes that means we need to do steps one, two, and three. We need to get the toothpaste on the toothbrush and we need to get it ready and we need to get it in their hand, in our hand to be able to do that. But then they can brush their teeth always thinking about what we can do to help them. Um, making sure um, that we're helping them with their skills. So people with dementia retain their strength more than their skills. So they'll lose the skill in doing something, but boy, do they keep their strength. This is why when we greet somebody, let's say this is my thumb and we shake hands, we switch like this instead of holding it like this, because people with dementia will squeeze and, and they don't know they're doing it. But if we switch like this, where we have this hand on, under hand, it's, they can squeeze, it won't hurt. And now I can still use my fingers to do things like brushing teeth. So some tips to take with you, um, hopefully we'll have some time for questions, but remember that we want to respond to the emotion that they're communicating. It's all about emotion. Maybe not respond necessarily to exactly what they're saying. People with dementia will say, I wanna go home. Well, I worked with somebody who actually lived in the house she grew up in, never lived anywhere else. And she still said, I wanna go home. So what is she communicating? What is her emotion? Respond to the emotion. Respect their reality. Keep that fish in the water as best as possible and help them to navigate the world um, and making them to feel successful versus incapable. And then remember that we're the ones who can change. They can't grow or learn. They, they can still grow and learn, but they're not going to be able to do that with the dementia in the same way. We're the ones who have to change. 
whenever we say somebody is really struggling or I'm really struggling with my loved one with dementia, and we just tweak that a little bit and say they're really struggling with their disease, just changes that perspective a little bit. So be a detective. Remember the six pieces of the puzzle that I showed you? Be a detective. We want to figure out what they're communicating. We don't want to judge. I work with somebody who said, anytime we want to ask somebody with dementia, why? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? We're asking them to make sense using a brain that's got diseases and the brain cells aren't communicating with each other. So we're just going to, going to avoid the judging piece. Um, always use this sequence for cues. So visual, show, tell, touch and match your help to remaining abilities. So you wanna help them to remain as independent as possible. And so yes, they may need a lot of help in queuing. They might even need you to wash their hair for them, but what can they do in that process and helping them to retain those abilities? Dementia can be, people say there's no treatment for dementia. Well, it can be treated with the care partners, being knowledgeable, building their skills, um, commitment to the support, being flexible with practicing role-playing um, with support and compassion. And so those, that's what I have. We have a few minutes for questions. This is my contact information. I'm gonna unshare my screen um, in just a second, but you can call, that's my main number. Um, and our website, and we're on Facebook. Any questions? Feel free to unmute everyone and ask away. Even if you just have, if you're caring for somebody with dementia and you've got a particular situation, you're curious um, what I might, how I might be helpful. Sherry, that was a superb presentation. I feel like I have been in an intensive class and uh, uh, even taking notes as fast as I can and photographing some of your slides. But uh, your, your expertise mm. and your caring um, demeanor uh, just uh, is so exciting. And um, uh, I think Dave and I uh, uh, learned an awful lot today. Well, thank you so much. I actually thought about you um, and your wife a lot when I was presenting today and what how patient and understanding you were and just caregiving for her. So um, you didn't have a lot to learn, but I appreciate the feedback. Sherry, do you have a handout that you can uh, dispense to us? And because it's going to be hard to duplicate how you presented it because it was so well done. And, and you know, and, and I recognize that what's on a sheet of paper isn't always just what you presented out. So uh, I, I thought it was a very uh, informative sort of thing, but mostly from a standpoint of being able to be uh, really not, not a, not, not just a caretaker, but a caring caretaker. Mm. Exactly, exactly. But but it, you know, like I said, it takes a lot of um, support because a caregiver can get burnt out very quickly. And what we're asking in this presentation is that the caregiver take on um, a, a a lot in trying to understand what that person with dementia is experiencing to help them. Um, but I'll tell you man, the caregivers that I work with that have made those changes have reported a much easier day-to-day -day life with reduction in those behaviors. Okay. Do you see the caretakers one at a time or do you see them in a group? Uh, so I, right now I work with them one-on-one um, -on -one or, or I work with families. Um, I did teach a class like that went over information like this. Um, and I've only taught it once and then COVID hit. So I haven't offered it again, but that would be a group setting where we would learn this in a group, a six week class. Um, but I haven't scheduled another one of those yet 
Oh, and to answer your question about the um, handouts, I have some different um, handouts that I can provide. Um, but it is, like you said, it's really hard to put this information mm -hmm. in a in a handout. It's what I do is I help caregivers change the way they think. Oftentimes they're thinking, I need to figure out how to change my loved one with dementia. But what ultimately ends up happening is the caregiver is the one who realizes what they need to learn and do different. Right. And it would be hard for anybody to pick it up off a piece of paper because what your involvement or personal contact, I think, has a has a major impact as far as being able to have people understand what what they are doing and they can improve on what they you know what they are not doing and can start doing. Yeah. So so again, I really I really welcome this and I. I recognize that, you know, you doing it in person is a much more powerful tool than my reading it on a piece of paper. Oh, for sure. And even this type of presentation, learning some of the skills, the hands-on skills and things and caring for people with dementia is easier done in person as well. Okay. Do you see dementia as being uh, delayed or helped or improved, but not cured? in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I hope there's a cure someday. Um, you know, from what we know and understand is there isn't a, a cure. Um, there are things we can do to optimize our brain health um, with, with nutrition and exercise. Um, and that's whether we have dementia or not. Um, so if we do not have dementia, we can reduce our risk of developing dementia by paying attention to our sleep, our diet, our exercise, our cognitive engagement, our socializing, and just making sure our, our health conditions are well managed. Um, once we have dementia, we can keep our brain as healthy as possible by doing those things. Um, the research, I haven't heard any research that's necessarily um, going to cure dementia or even slow the progression, but we can help the good brain cells um, work at their best for as long as possible by doing some of those brain health things. Yeah. yeah. Although there is some literature out that is saying that our changes in our brain begin in our 20s so that maybe if we start a little earlier, it will make a difference in being able to maintain it throughout. So uh, again, what a, what a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, I have to run, but I've got a 12.30 appointment. So uh, uh, great job. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you will be a critical part of our library. As you are a critical <laughs> part of so many other aspects of it. So thank you. Good. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, my name is Kim Jankowski, and I um, have a question about personal care. And I, my mother um, refuses to change her clothes, um, trim her nails, trim, uh, let, her, let us cut her hair. I've, we've tried everything. And she just doesn't think she, she doesn't want anybody to touch her. Um, is there anything else that we could try that we're not doing or that's, um, that's our biggest problem with her. She's pretty compliant with other things. She doesn't, but uh, that's, you know, especially the, the hygiene mm -hmm. is what we're most concerned about. Yeah, that's, those are all very tactile sensory things that um, she must be experiencing her dementia impacting her brain in a way that is causing her senses to just be fired up. Um, generally speaking, if things don't feel good, we don't want to do it. And if things do feel good, then we'll do it a lot. And so um, personal cares that can just really be extremely uncomfortable for some people with dementia, which is why we see they don't want to change their clothes. 
Um, having my clothes off can feel very uncomfortable. The process, the steps involved with taking it on and off. Um, and then I've got my pride. I don't need help. I don't want help. And so um, I would rather, you know, I'll not that I would rather, but um, I will believe that I don't need to change my clothes. I don't need my, my fingernails clipped and I don't need my hair cut. And so, you know, any amount of reasoning and explaining and convincing, I'm guessing doesn't necessarily make her feel better. No, it doesn't. She just refuses. Uh, won't even let me, you know, touch her to comb her hair. Yeah. Or pull it back. It's gotten very long and it's always in her face and she's always complaining about it. Mm. But whenever I suggest, let me trim it a little bit, just make it feel, you know, she says no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely not <laughs> it's yeah it's frustrating a great a great place to start is by validating the emotion so you know if she's frustrated with her hair then saying you know boy your hair is really frustrating you we can do a lot tricking the brain in caregiving we do some trickery and stuff to help people with dementia um, feel cared for and supported. And, and that's not even trickery if we're dealing with each other who don't have dementia. Validating people's emotions can really help people feel heard. And so validating it can help her kind of shift her brain into not being so defensive. If we've worked really hard and tried really hard convincing her we may have actually created a situation where she has her own block on it now because I, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And so we might need to repeat that to her. So when we say, you know, um, you know, mom, you need to, we need to get you in the shower. Um, and she goes, no, I don't need a shower. Get out of here. Okay. You don't, you don't want to shower. You don't want to shower. I understand that. Kind of getting her a little bit backing off the need to push back. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then getting her to actually bathe. When we think about bathing, we think that means we get in the shower, we're naked, water sprays on us, we get soapy, we get rinsed off. But there's a lot of ways to get clean that doesn't involve doing that. Mm -hmm. So how it's all about thinking, how can we help her to be cleaner? And it might be a long process. We're, we're, remember when I was talking about our agenda as caregivers, we have an agenda. We need to get her washed. Let's let, set our agenda to the side and see what we can get done and then celebrate the little steps in, in, in whatever that may be. Like we might, you know, there's 10 fingers. And maybe we do one a day. Mm. And after 10 days, we've got them all. And mm -hmm. then maybe we have to go back to the first one the next day. Um, but, you know, but rather than convincing her to do that, we could, we could say, you know, how did, does that feel okay right there? You know, that feels, does that feel okay? You know, and then validating her like, oh, it's okay. That feels okay. You know, mm -hmm. we're not trying to change her mind. We're repeating what she said. We're validating what she said, that we heard her. When she feels heard, she may be more likely, you know, than asking her for a favor. You know, I wonder if you would help me with something. I've just got a, one thing I've got to do. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes posing it as a favor can be more effective than um, trying to convince her to do it. So um, this would definitely be something that I could help you with when we looked at the six pieces of the puzzle, mm -hmm. um, me offering you some suggestions right now can kind of get your brain going. But when you really, I, there's a lot of things that kind of apply to other things. So we might be able to find uh, ways and approach that could actually apply to other things in your life as well. Um, so I throw some ideas at you um, gingerly because I understand that my whole presentation was all about peeling back the layers and there's more conversation to be had, but just throwing that out there to give you some ideas to think about. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Feel free to give me a call. <laughs> Any other questions? 
I just have a comment about the caregiver. And I, I took care of my mom with help for about 10 years of her life with uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, one of the things I found really helpful was to surround yourself with a group of people that are supporting what you're doing. Um, because there's there's a lot of people that are going to be negative and tell you you're doing the wrong thing. So by forming that group that surrounds you, that really, you know, loves the person that has the dementia and, and loves you, it makes it a little bit easier to get through the whole process. I love that. That is so true. It's so funny how people have opinions on what you're doing when they're so far removed. It's like, oh my gosh, just come and spend a day. But yes, having people who, who know and understand and can support you. I mean, when I, when somebody gets diagnosed with dementia, it takes a village. There's no way we can do it on our own. There's no way we can do it on our own. So we've got to let the world know, let's get rid of the stigma we've got attached to dementia, let people know and let people support us. Good point. Thanks for your presentation. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Any other questions?